Hey everybody, what I wanted to do in this video is walk you through some of the prototype assets that come with the template projects inside of Unreal 5. I think there's a lot of cool stuff here that doesn't get noticed and I kind of wanted to walk through what is here and how we can use them for quick level prototyping, especially if we're a level designer and we want to block out something very quickly. If you make a, I'm in a third person template and you have this level with these blocks in it, we have a ramp, we have this gridded material, we have these blue blocks, and if we hit play, our character can move around. But we can actually do a lot of more interesting things with this. So for example, if I press control space, that to bring up our content browser, you can dock it to if you want, I don't need to. Over here, if I expand the level prototyping folder, maybe a future version of Unreal, like maybe it won't have this, I don't know. But as of now, when I'm recording it, if you see this, there's some interesting stuff in here that I wanted to talk about. So inside of this level prototyping folder, we have materials. We'll go through these in a second. These are our materials that are related to our grid. You can see the grid um, units that are measured on the side of the walls. Very helpful to know while we are trying to block out gameplay. We also see meshes, which are our default objects. These are you know primitives and basic things that we can scale very easily. Ramps, uh, like a quarter cylinder, a cylinder, and a cube. That's really all we get and that's all we really need for now. Um, we can make other shapes with the modeling tools as well if we want. And then a texture that is mainly being used with the materials. So uh, we'll talk about that briefly and kind of see how it works. All right, so when it comes to the meshes, you can already see these same meshes scaled around the world. Um, all of these come from these basic primitives. So if we click this cube over here, I think it's important to understand that even though this is a rectangle, it is originally a cube. So this is just a cube that is scaled to 12, 3, 2, right? If we put this back to 1, 1, 1, it's still a cube. But what we can do is we can very quickly scale that up and make different kinds of shapes, which is very interesting and cool. But the reason why this is important is because all of these different cube shapes point back to this static mesh, meaning that it's all looking here. And if we were to delete this, all of our rectangles and walls and floors would be deleted. We probably don't want that, but it is important to know, right? So we are just duplicating this primitive shape around our map and we don't want to delete it. We're just using it to visualize and to block out things. And we'll talk briefly about how to export that later, but it is important to know. So anytime you see these little partial cylinders right here, it's pointing back to this one. All the cylinders are pointing back to that one. And the ramp is just this ramp, but scaled upwards or downwards. So you can see the pivot is at a convenient location so that we can very quickly like make this longer or taller or whatever. Now let's talk about materials and material instances because I don't think everyone watching this will know what they are or even know the difference. A material, if you double click a material, you're gonna see a lot of instructions and nodes and basically the rules on how this material is rendered and calculated. But if I control space again, if I were to click on something with the MI underscore, this is a little different. This is an example of the material, but with very limited scope. The material can actually expose different kind of variables from the material that is setting it up. And we can make material instances, which are just like examples of a material. So we're pulling from those instructions. We're just changing the variables that are defined in those instructions. The main thing to know here is that materials can take a lot of resources. Material instances are very simple and uh, don't take a whole lot of resources. So if you want to create a new color, for example, we wouldn't duplicate the solid material. We would create a material instance out of the solid material and then change the color to a different color. So we're not duplicating the instructions, right? We're making a new instance of that and we are changing the variables and parameters. So that's the big thing to know. If you see MF, it's a material function. That is a different thing that we don't need to worry about right now in this lecture. We have two materials that come with our level prototyping materials. One is for a prototype grid and one is for a solid color. So anytime you need a solid color in your map, for example, these cubes, all you would do is you'd create a new material instance. So right click, create material instance, MI uh, orange or solid underscore orange. Right. And so then we can double click this, check this and say, I want to change this value. Click here and then change it to a different color. So I could change this to orange, which is pretty cool. Yeah, we can make different versions of this. It's very useful to do this quickly to make new 
material colors quickly. The key point here is we're right clicking and creating a material instance from a set of instructions on the material and then changing this. So this is way more optimized. Don't duplicate materials. We don't need to create a material instance out of a material. Or you can duplicate a material instance and then just change it around. Okay, so we mentioned that we have some additional parameters. Let's just cover a few of them. Let's start with a solid, which I mean, really we usually only wanna change the color, but if you wanted to change how it is rendered, like the sheen, if, if you're trying to create a simulated metal material, you could adjust this value some. It's usually like zero to one. That could make it look different. Usually if I'm using solid colors, I want it to be quick and I'm not really concerned about the metallic and the roughness. The roughness is just like, it'll be either smooth almost like a, like a polished pool ball or something, but you can leave these by default. The main thing is if you wanna change any of these values, just make sure you click this and then you change it to the color you want. You can actually use RGB if you like. So if you want new colors in your prototyping, just make a new material instance from the solid or duplicate it and change the color. Now let's talk about the material prototype grid. And I have some instances over here. Uh, I can't remember which ones it, come, it came with since I had made a couple and tried to delete them out. This right here, this top dark one, as well as the prototype grid, they're both material instances of the prototype grid material, just with different settings. So what I'm gonna do just to show you is I'm going to create a new one. So create material instance from the prototype grid. Make sure to add the I, so material instance, prototype grid, we'll say 02, something. And if I open this up, you can see a lot of extra uh, features over here. And let me zoom out here with my middle mouse wheel. So the first one is you can change the grid size and the grid numbering. I'm just gonna leave it by default, but if for whatever reason your game requires a different type of sizing, you can definitely mess with that. We can change the color just like we could with the solid. So surface color we can make this like a, like a blue. And then once we change this, we may decide, you know what? We want to change the grid color as well. Maybe uh, change the grid color. You may need to drag this up over here on the right to make it lighter. So you can see now instead of a dark grid, we have a white grid. And then we have the subgrid, which are the smaller units between the bigger ones. You know, you can mess with all this stuff. Now, one cool thing that I wanna talk about is this top surface. If you click the top surface and you say, yes, I do want a top surface, it will automatically change the color of the top of anything in your scene. So this default one over here, you can probably see it. The sides are a light gray, but the top is a dark gray with a white grid. You can create that effect by doing the top surface right here. So if you select that, then you now have the ability to change the colors of both of those things, the surface color and the grid on the top grid as well. So for example, what if I wanted to change this from dark gray to dark blue? Hit okay, save. And you can mess with all this stuff, right? You can take it, you can apply it to a new object. So let's say that we have, I don't know, some other floor over here. I'm just gonna hold Alt and duplicate that. We can drag our material instance that we customized over there. And you can see now we have this lighter blue slash purple. Maybe, maybe I'm slightly colorblind here. This lighter color on the side and it will automatically put the darker color on top. You could do it even this way, right? Like we rotate it, it is automatically deciding what the top is and applying that color, which is very cool and useful for prototyping. So we don't have to worry about different surfaces and things that can actually take a lot of time where we're only worried about the block out, right? Like we wanna be able to very quickly stack blocks like this. Or whatever, we can resize. You can see um, the way this grid material works. When I resize, it will automatically maintain the grid, right? It was pretty cool. Anyways, that, that's how the material instances will work. So another important thing to point out, and let me just double check something on this material I made. Yes, right here. Okay, so I'm gonna put this on object aligned and explain what that means in a second. This check mark right here, we have the ability to make the grid object aligned or world aligned. And here's the difference. If I hit save, so right now I have object aligned rather than world. If I do object aligned and I were to rotate this, you see how my grid is now at an angle? This is aligning the grid locally to this object, which has its uses, especially if we are trying to build simple objects that we want to export out later for an environment artist to make it something prettier and nicer. Um, we can do that. But sometimes we want to have our world aligned grid. So uh, let me show you another example. Let me come back here and make this world aligned instead. Save. And now if I rotate it, you see how it's almost projecting the grid onto that piece? Um, that can be kind of useful just to see measurements at an angle or measurements like how long is the side? And we can kind of mess with this, but 
One other thing that is useful about the world aligned grid as opposed to the object one, if I come back here and I turn this back on object aligned, let's say that you are quickly laying out a level, right? You are you're doing this and you are stacking objects and you have them overlapping. Now, it's not a big deal because the collisions will kind of handle that. Uh, we don't need to perfectly align them and match them up, especially in the block out. But one thing you may notice is the grid is just going crazy. This is the bad part about object alignment is that if you have overlapping shapes, we get something called Z fighting, which is where it's not sure how to render, you know, this material because it's two objects that are perfectly overlapping and it doesn't know which one to prioritize. So it flickers back and forth. If we were to change this back to world aligned like that, save. Now you see it's projecting the grid onto it. And because there's not two different object grids competing, it is just one being projected onto geometry. We can actually have overlapping collision shapes and it's not a big deal. You may not want to do this all the time, but it honestly doesn't matter because this is going to be exported out and cleaned up and fixed eventually uh, so that we can focus on our block out and just get it looking how we want and get it playing well. Instead of worrying about perfectly aligning all the sides, like that can take a lot of time and we don't need to worry about it. So sometimes you may want to use a world space grid while you're blocking out. But if you're working on smaller pieces that are meant to be modular, you may want to put those on object space, right? With our setting, our, um, our object aligned, you may want to put that on object aligned. Uh, you may want one material, like one prototype material for object and then one for world, and then just use it appropriately. Use whichever one you want according to what you're trying to do. So individual modular assets, maybe you want object aligned so you can rotate them around and still get your measurements. But if you're blocking out just general world geometry and structure, you might want world aligned so that you can overlap pieces very quickly and easy and not have to worry about it because... Uh, we don't need to worry about it. So that is the difference between object aligned and world space and how it can help you avoid Z fighting while you are quickly blocking out your level. All right. So another thing I wanted to mention when we're doing our block outs, there is a difference between just taking a block and moving it around. Right, if we're trying to create a shape, our grid will automatically scale for us. And um, we can do this very quickly without a whole lot of hassle, right? We could rotate it if we want. My pivots are a little weird right now scale it down and mash them together to create a little thing and just pull it in and do something like that. You know, this could be very quick, but if you want something more detailed, like you want to create more organic shapes or very specific shapes, you can go into Unreal's modeling tools, like Unreal modeling. You can create a custom block and it will create a new block, change it here if you want. But once you click accept, it will make a new asset. If you hit control space, um, it will be in here somewhere. I think it's typically in the map. Yeah, generated yeah, right here. So it creates a new static mesh and file. So instead of pulling from that other prototype cube, it is actually creating a new custom one. And then we can go and we can use the modeling tools, which I'm not going to get into now because that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. But I just wanted to mention that if you did want to prototype and then create more custom geometry, you could, but do the fastest thing, right? Like if it is faster for you to do this and make some shape with our modeling tools, do that. If it's faster for you to mash shapes together, do that. Because in the end, we only care about the final form, uh, the, the silhouette, the shape, the blocking, the architecture, and the structure. We're not really concerned about creating the perfect ideal model. That will happen later on when we're doing our decoration because we really want to prototype the gameplay right now. Anyways, there's a difference between making a custom model like this with modeling, and you have a lot more options and tools but a lot of the times with blockouts, you can just rescale and handle the grid and it'll be fine. I guess I should also mention, you can look into the cube grid is a very quick and efficient way to pull blocks around inside of their modeling tool. But again, I'm not gonna go into that here yet either because that's a whole different tool that is very fun to use, but a little bit out of scope. Another thing I wanted to mention is that as you are blocking out and defining gameplay, you may have mechanics that are associated with the volume. So maybe, you have some kind of kill volume or water or conveyor belt or something, you may want to associate a color with that thing. So you would decide if you want that uh, object. So let's say if you want a grid on that or if you want a solid color, if it's like a kill volume or something, I may go either way, right? Like I want to know how that's sized. Um, but if it's meant to be a volume that will just be varying sizes like water or whatever, then I think a solid color is fine. I could use this here, but just to uh, review and show you again, um, I'm going to go to my solid material, right click, 
Create material instance. Again, do not duplicate your material. Uh, rename this mi underscore solid. You could say red or if you want to reuse it, or you can say damage volume, or you can name it what it is. It's prototyping. It doesn't really matter. I find it easier to just remember a color and use that color consistently to associate a thing. Um, so we duplicated that. We open it up. Uh, let's change the color here. So I do want to change the base color. We'll change it to red. That's more of a purple, I guess. Reddish, orange, just a maybe. And we want to use this color consistently through our level to communicate a certain kind of gameplay. In this case, it might be uh, damage, like some kind of damage volume. So I will duplicate this volume, scale it down. Like let's imagine the floor is lava, right? Scale it out. And maybe everything over here is some kind of damagey volume. Then I can go over here and I can drag and drop this and it will replace the material. And you see the Z fighting, right? Like you can either move it right there, or you can make a world space, uh, but I guess I can't really do that on the solid material. If you wanted to avoid Z fighting, you could just put it on the grid material. Um, so just to remind you of that, let's say I wanted to do a grid version. I could take my prototype grid, create material instance, MI underscore grid, lava world space or something or uh, i guess this would be red okay let's customize it real quick just to show you how fast this stuff like surface color change it yeah you know, something you can change it you can change the grid color so that it reads better on a lighter color background right something like that and then i think that's it we don't want to mess with the top surface color but we can uh physical material oh world space that's what we wanted so by default it is in world space, I believe. So let's save it. And then control space, drag and drop it. So now, well, we're getting Z fighting because this is not world space, I think. But uh, if we had the same thing on the object next to it, just, you know, feel it out. These are all options for you and you can use this however you want. Um, but maybe you want to measure out the lava, I think would be useful. Um, but you can see this object space one, uh, just be aware of how you use it. Uh, because you know this is this is showing you a different grid this grid is local to the object versus this is world okay and the last thing i want to show you is let's say you block out your level and you make this really cool object and you and you are now handing this to an artist and an artist has to take your block out and you know try and find a way to match the geometry to it how would they do that so let, let's say that you want to save all this stuff out you can click everything that you want to save out so i'm just clicking Hold control, click, 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 click. And you wouldn't be doing this as a level designer. This is probably the environment artist trying to take apart your uh, block out and trying to export this shape into a separate uh, package. But if you select some shapes and you go up to file, export selected, um, you can see I was already trying and FBX saving it out, but you could actually save this anywhere you want. Let's go to our desktop, for example. But you probably don't want to save it directly to your desktop. FBX. Let's call this ramp structure. We could do some settings. We could save it out. I'm just really showing you that you can do this. We're not going to do the formal process, but, and then it will save out an FBX file. And then we could take this FBX file into some other modeling program and then dress it up. We can add more art. We can perfectly align the collisions. We can make a better collision and export that out if we want. We can do whatever we want and then bring that in and the artist can then replace this structure with a better version of it that is closely aligned to what they got from the block out and then just replace it. So that's the general process. I mean, this, this changes depending on how your collaboration process is, but as long as you know the basic prototype tools here, what you have available, you know, the different material prototype stuff that you have, like with the grid and the world space, just blocking shapes together to create gameplay very quickly. And in the end, your artist can go in and take your block out and turn it into something that looks really cool, like the final version, so that you can just focus on the gameplay. Like you can test all your gameplay in a block out map. Um, you can always communicate things with materials like we did with this lava over here or whatever this could be. Um, this is kind of reminding me of that old Mario Kart uh, versus map now, but do your block out, but this is the process on how you can lay out your levels and kind of what you're working with. And then it's just a matter of making bigger levels. So hope this helps you out. Hope, hopefully this gets you a little bit more comfortable with what comes inside of this level prototyping folder. I didn't know some of these things about the uh, materials. I just wanted to share with all y'all.